the last unit is about contrastive learning. What is the problem with the pretext tasks that we have discussed so far? Well, in this pretext task for pre-training the large chunk of parameters in the neural network, we we're considering a task that at first glance is completely decoupled from, from the downstream task. So for example, here in this case, we're trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle for pre-training the parameters of the neural network. And then we're attaching small linear or MLP readout hats to this network and training the parameters of these readout layers using fewer supervised examples on the actual downstream task, which in this case is image classification. But we don't know that this jigsaw puzzle solution task is actually related to the downstream image classification task. How should we know? We don't know. And as I mentioned, there is no good theory that we can use here. It's all empirical. Um, so what we do, in other words, is we, we hope really hard that the pre-training task and the transfer task are aligned and try to find better pre-training uh, pre tasks um, that are better aligned with the downstream task. And that's what contrastive learning is about. So here's another illustration of the problem of this pretext uh, pre uh, feature uh, features learned from this pretext task, for example, in the case of a jigsaw puzzle. What happens if we attach the readout hat at different layers of that network? Is illustrated here in terms of, in this case, MAP of the downstream task performance. Higher is better. The task doesn't really matter here for this purpose of this illustration. What we observe, however, is that the pretext feature performance saturates. So if we go to later layers, more semantic layers, layers that should actually be better for um, our downstream classification task, and we attach our linear readout there, the performance saturates or even drops at some point. What is the reason for this? Well, the reason is that the pretext task, the jigsaw puzzle task is too different from the image classification task and that the last layers then therefore have specialized for that pretext task. The last layers are very specific to solving jigsaw puzzles or very specific to solve context prediction or to rotation estimation, but they don't contain the semantic knowledge required for solving the image classification task. And so performance degrades. The question is now, can we find a more general pretext task? What is desirable? Well, the first thing that's desirable is, of course, the pre-trained features should somehow represent how image relate to each other. So for example, images, even if slightly altered um, of the same object of a cat, should be in the same well, feature in the same area of the feature space. And images of different animals should live in different areas of the feature space. But at the same time also, the um, feature should be invariant to nuisance factors, such as the specific location of the object or the lighting conditions or the color, etc. So all of these versions, and you can recognize some of the pretext tasks that we talked about before, all of these versions here should be similar to this one here. But what we are now going to do in the context of contrastive learning is not to try to predict some information that has been lost, but rather to try to make those similar directly. And so we can use any augmentation that we want. These augmentations that we generate from a reference image, this is the reference image here, are called views. So this is one view, this is another view, this is another view. In this community, they are called views, just to introduce the terminology already. So in short, we want to build a model where for a particular reference image, different views of that reference image are, are close in feature space, 
but any view of any other object is further away. And that's at an intuitive level exactly what's happening. How do we implement this? This is the picture from before. You can see the reference here called X and you can see the positive examples which are different views, alter alterations through data augmentation. We've removed some part, we've rotated it, we've changed the color, we've uh, cropped it, etc. But they should all be similar. And then we have X minus, which is a negative. That's from a different image or different region in the image. That's very far away from the region of interest. So we can call this a negative. These are positives and these are negatives with respect to the reference. And what we want to do now mathematically is given a particular chosen scoring function S, we want to learn an encoder network F that yields high score for positive pairs X, S, X plus and low score for negative pairs X, X minus. Or in other words, we want the score of F of X and F of X plus to be larger than the score of F of X and F of X minus. And we're going to formulate this as an optimization problem. This is the de facto standard contrastive learning objective that we consider. Assume we have one reference, x, one positive, and n minus one negative examples. The positive example is called x plus, and the n minus negative examples are called x minus j. Now consider the following multi-class cross-entropy loss function. This is a standard multi-class cross-entropy loss function as it is used in ImageNet classification. Except that now we do have the scoring function inside. So the loss is minus the expectation over the entire data set that is composed of um, each of these samples is one reference, one positive, and n minus one negative examples. And we have many of those that we can generate, we can draw from a data distribution. So it's expectation uh, over the entire data set of the logarithm of this um, exponential of the scoring function of the reference to the, the features of the reference to the features of the positive example divided over the sum of the positive and all the negatives. Right? You can see this, this uh, softmax here. And this is commonly known as the info NCE loss as has been coined by Ort van den Ort et al. in 2018. And the interesting thing about this objective is that it's, um, it's negative minus L is a lower bound on the mutual information between f of x and f of x plus between the features of all the reference reference images or patches and all the corresponding positives and the detailed derivation of this is given in or 2018 the paper is linked here at the bottom we don't have time to go into detail here in this, in this lecture. The only thing that's important here is that the mutual information between these two features is bigger or equal than the logarithm of n minus l. And the larger the negative sample size and the tighter this bound. That's another crucial takeaway. We need really a large n, a large negative set for this to work. But what we can see here from this equation is already the key idea that we're trying to follow. The key idea, namely, is to maximize the mutual information between the features extracted from multiple views, which forces the features to capture information about higher level factors. This is the, co the goal here. We want to maximize, we want to minimize the loss. So we want to maximize the mutual information between multiple views of the reference image. This is what this objective here tries to do. And if you do that, here's one particular method. We don't suffer from the problem that I just mentioned. 
We can also take features at later layers that are still well aligned with the downstream task, in this case, ImageNet classification accuracy. There's a couple of design choices for these contrastive methods that we can consider. And there's also a couple of problems related to it. For example, the large amount of negatives that lead to very large memory requirements. And so we're going to discuss these different design choices and problems in the following. The first design choice is the scoring function. We haven't talked about the scoring function so far. We've seen there's a feature function that produces a feature vector from an image or patch. So it takes this image, produces a feature. It takes a view, an augmentation of this image, and produces another feature. And then there's a scoring function. And the most common choice for the scoring function is simply the cosine similarity, which is the inner product between the features divided by their norm. If you remember the lecture on stereo, where we're also discussing uh, Siamese networks, similar to here, this is also Siamese network because the features are computed with the same network from the inputs. Um, we're using the same score function. The second design choice is how to choose the examples, the positive and the negative examples. In contrastive predictive coding, these examples are taken from the same image in a way that related examples are chosen from nearby regions, for example here the crown of the tree, and unrelated negatives are chosen far away. The more common um, scenario nowadays is so-called instance discrimination, where we say, well, all the patches from the same image and the image has to depict not, not an entire scene. It doesn't work with scenes with multiple objects. It has to be something like ImageNet where there's a single object. It's a very simple scene, like this tree here. But then if it's a single object, I say that all of the patches that are related to each other, or all the patches from the same image are related to each other because all of them are somehow showing a tree. And the unrelated ones are Take any random different image and take any random patch from that different image. That's called instance discrimination because we're we're discriminating instances. And the third design choice, the third axis is augmentations. There we have a big playground, but now in contrast to these pretext tasks that we have to find before, we can combine all the augmentations that we want, and that's what's happening in practice and what's really important for making these methods work. For example, we can crop the image, we can resize the image, we can flip the image, we can rotate the image or cut out a region from the image. We can also drop some colors or jitter the colors. We can add Gaussian noise or Gaussian blur or compute edges. One of the um, top performing methods in this space currently is called SimClear for simple framework for contrastive learning. It uses a cosine similarity score function where now we have C here as the arguments, um, which is the features from before, but I'm, I'm taking the figure here from the paper. And uh, what you can see here is that SimClear takes the input reference image and produces two different views through randomly sampled augmentations. And then it runs the uh, network F that we're interested in. This is the network that we optimize for to produce a representation. And on top of that, it, produ it, it runs a projection network, um, which we are not interested in and which is thrown away after training, which produces Z. Um, so this representation we are interested in, but the C is only, this, this projection is only required for for better training and i do believe this is also required similar to the pretext task that we discussed earlier because the task itself is not directly related to the uh, contrastive learning objective the downstream task so it helps to take 
earlier features, in other words, similar to before. And another reason for having a projection network is that we can also project into higher dimensional spaces. So we can play with, with the dimensionality here. And that also makes a difference. So F is what we want. G is an auxiliary network that we use during training, but throw away afterwards. And improves learning because more relevant information is preserved in H, which is discarded later in C as it's closer to the contrastive learning objective. Here are some of the augmentations that are used. You can see crop and resize, color distortions, rotations, Gaussian noise, Gaussian blur, all the things that we discussed before. And it turns out that actually these augmentations, having a diverse set of powerful augmentations is really crucial for getting good performance with these methods. This is the pseudocode of the method. It's actually quite simple to understand. So first we draw two augmented augmentation functions and then we generate a positive pair by assembling data, uh, this data augmentation function. So we have um, the first one t of xk and then t uh, prime of xk that produces these two views, the first and the second view or the first and the second augmentation. And then we run the network, we run the representation and the projection network to get h and c for each of those. And then we define here the um, info NCE loss that we discussed before. And we iterate through and use each of the two n samples as references and compute the average loss. You can see we have the sum goes from k equal one to n, but we have in the this loss, we have two k minus one and two k. So we have it twice because each of these pairs is serves as one uh, serves as a reference and then the the other view is the positive while all the others are negatives. So this is how the loss is implemented. And it works, it works amazingly well. So here we see results, you can also compare it to some of the older methods like rotation and instance discrimination. Um, and it produces much better performance. This is top one accuracy on ImageNet compared to the supervised method. You can see that if we increase the number of parameters, this is a model that has is four times wider than this model. We are on par with the supervised pre-trained model. And in this setup here, we train the feature encoder on ImageNet on the entire training set using simply but without labels. And then we freeze the feature encoder and train a linear classifier on top with label data. What's happening here is that we train the feature encoder on ImageNet again on the entire training set using self-supervision. And then we fine tune the encoder with only 1% or 10% of the label data on ImageNet. So this is a much smaller data set now for fine tuning. And what can be observed is that in these cases, we significantly outperform now the supervised baseline that doesn't, that has only seen this 1% or 10% fraction of the supervised data samples. And of course, if we have just 1%, then the performance gain is, is even larger than if we have 10% of data for the supervised baseline. However, a large training batch size is crucial for SimClear. What we have here is for different number of training epochs, we have the batch size from 256, which is already pretty large, to 8,129. And you can see that the top performance respectively is achieved at around 2,000 or 4,000 negatives. And this is problematic. Remember, we have a Siamese network and we need to forward pass and backward pass through all the negatives for training. In the forward pass, we have to store the activations and the backward pass, we compute the gradient. So it's a huge memory requirement. And that's why this type of model can't be, can, can only be trained at Google scale. So it can be trained on your GPU, not even a GPU node with eight GPUs at home, but it requires distributed training on, on TPUs in this case. 
for these ImageNet experiments. So this is not nice. Um, this makes it rather impractical uh, as it requires these huge compute centers. And uh, to alleviate that problem, a method called momentum contrast has been proposed, which in spirit is similar to SimClear, but has, has a couple of major innovations that reduce the memory requirements. Here's the model. The idea is that we have now um, so-called queries and keys. So they, they phrase it in terms of a, of a database with queries and keys. But the keys, I mean, these are really just positive um, and uh, this, are, this is a reference and these are negatives here um, for which we want to com uh, compute the contrastive loss um, using a cosine similarity as before. And here we have, after the encoder, we have the features after the encoder of the keys, we have the key features. Now, the, the crucial thing about momentum contrast or MoCo is to keep a running queue or dictionary of keys for the negative samples. You can think of this as a ring buffer of mini batches. We push in here, we have a very long ring buffer where we push in a new mini batch, maybe that's 64 or 128 negatives, and we remove in that ring buffer, we remove the oldest of the 128 negatives. And that's how we update the ring buffer with these keys. And then we don't backpropagate gradients to these uh, negatives to these keys here, but only to the query encoder, not to the queue. And therefore we don't have to store all the intermediate activations we just have to store the final result, the features, the keys. And therefore the dictionary can be much larger than the mini batch size. The problem with this is now that the dictionary becomes inconsistent as the encoder. So if we would take this encoder as this encoder here, this is what is updated. So we, can, we could just clone it and, and use this encoder here. If we would take this encoder as the encoder for the keys as well, we would have a completely differently encoded mini batch inside that dictionary. So each mini batch would have been encoded with a completely different encoder because that encoder varies relatively quickly over time because it gets updated through the parameters. To alleviate this problem and to improve consistency of the keys in the queue, the, what was proposed in this paper was to use momentum. Momentum similar to momentum in uh, stochastic gradient descent, where now we don't just copy this encoder, but we use a momentum encoder that's a linear combination of, well, the query encoder and the previous momentum encoder, such that there's less fluctuation, there's more consistency across the keys, across the features inside that big queue that have been encoded using different encoders. So we're smoothing it out. And this is key to actually making it work. And this is already a result from um, an improved version called MoCo version two, where they have now used also stronger augmentation like in SimClear, which hasn't been used in MoCo version one before. Um, and the nonlinear projection head, which both turned out to be crucial here as well. But the key difference to SimClear is that now the same or even better performance can be obtained at a much smaller batch size. So this can be now trained using, well, not your home GPU, but at least using a regular eight GPU node um, without uh, like a Google scale TPU cluster, because the batch size is only 256 compared to 8,000 or 4,000 for SimClear at the same performance. <clears throat> so this is now the last part of this unit. All of the methods that I've shown so far in this unit were classical contrastive learning methods. And there's many more I've just highlighted some of the most prominent ones. But a very recently proposed method deviates a little bit from this paradigm and makes things even simpler. It's called Barlow twins. And it's inspired by information theory, as it tries to reduce redundancy between neurons. 
reduces redundancy between neurons, not between samples. It doesn't tr it doesn't uh, look at, at distances of samples. It just looks at distances of neurons. That's why it's so simple. And the key idea is that neurons should be invariant to data augmentations, but independent of others. In this example, an image is projected uh, or is, is augmented in two two different ways. So these are two different views of that image, and then passed through the network that we want to train to yield a representation. Imagine this to be a 64 dimensional feature vector CA and 64 dimensional feature vector CB. Or maybe let's say it's a three dimensional feature vector CA and a three dimensional feature vector CB. Blue, green, and red are the three features. And now what we want is that for these two different views, this feature, the red feature is similar because these are two different augmentations of the same object. And the green feature is also similar to the green feature from the overview. And the blue feature is also similar to the blue feature from the overview. But at the same time, we, we want to minimize redundancy. We want the features themselves to be different from each other. We want the blue feature to be different from the green one and from the red one. How can we formulate this mathematically? Well, the idea here is to simply compute the cross correlation matrix over the mini batch. We take the mini batch, compute the empirical cross correlation, and then encourage this to be the identity or to become the identity matrix. So we have a loss that tries to make the off diagonal elements zero and the diagonal elements one. And the intuition is, of course, that the diagonal elements are the neurons across the different augmentations, which should be correlated, the same neuron. But on the off diagonal, they should be not correlated to minimize redundancy. Very simple. So here's just the correlation, and this is the loss that's used. The crucial difference to SimClear and MoCo is that no negative samples are needed like in classical contrastive learning, but the contrastive learning here happens at the neuron, in the in neuron space. And it's super simple to implement. We, we compute the represent, we, we take two randomly augmented versions of X, we compute the representations, normalize them, compute cross correlation, the loss and back prop. It's probably one of the simplest uh, self-supervised learning methods that you could implement. And it works. It's a simple method that performs on par with state of the art. If you compare it to, for example, SimClear here on, on ImageNet or uh, with a fine tuning experiment or just looking at linear readout classifiers. It is um, also um, more mildly affected by batch size compared to SimClear at least. So you can see here the red curve which is uh, is a little bit affected by the batch size, but at 256 or 512, you can still get reasonable result for this method. Reasonable results for this method. They also found similar to the previous approaches that projection into a higher dimensional space. Well, no, in this case, projection into a higher dimensional space, but it's also projection um, only for the pre-training leads to better results. So again, here's a yellow auxiliary network, projector network added uh, before the uh, correlation that is thrown away afterwards and only the cyan feature encoder is, is the end product, the result of this method. But having this projection helps. And in particular, what's interesting here is that you can increase the output dimensionality of this MLP, this little MLP, and performance keeps on increasing. Here's a comparison of um, uh, this method in red and Boyle and SimClear in black. That's it for today. Um, we talked about many different methods and I wanna briefly summarize. Creating labeled data is time consuming and expensive as we've seen in the first unit. Self-supervised methods have the potential to overcome this by learning from data alone without any labeled examples. 
task specific models typically minimize some photo consistency measures for predicting optical flow or depth. Pretext tasks have been introduced to, in contrast, learn more generic representations. And these generic representations can then be fine tuned to the target task, like image classification or normal prediction. However, classical pretext tasks, such as rotation estimation, often do not well align with the target task. And contrastive learning and redundancy reduction, in contrast, are better aligned and produce state-of-the-art results. So they close the gap, as we see right now, to fully supervised ImageNet pre-tanning. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.